I wanted to share one um, story from my childhood. Um, we have turned the clock today to the summertime. And I remembered my mom, uh, who was normally very stressed, or he, she hated uh, the hurry or busyness, especially at the table. Um, I don't know how your breakfasts are. Uh, normally we feel uh, a bit busy and in a hurry. It was the same as I was a child. And we had, uh, our dining room was in the kitchen. So we had the kitchen clock and we always tended to eat like this and look at the clock. And my mom just didn't like it. And once she made a very small but wise and powerful move. She replaced the clock with an icon. And it took weeks for us uh, till we got used to it. And we kept on looking, eating and looking at the clock. But then we saw, instead of the clock, the face of Jesus Christ. And it was very powerful. Uh, so uh, I, I still remember it after 40 years. Uh, and my question is, what or who controls us and our lives? Is it the clock, the calendar, or the sports clock, or how do you call it? Uh, clock. Or is it Jesus Christ, the eternal God? Thank you. So... We have Tina with us, but I'm not saying more. Who are you? Where are you from? And what are you doing here? <laughs> All right, many so, questions. Yeah, many questions. So I'm Tina. Uh, very nice to meet you all and be here. I'm really excited about it. I am uh, German. So I currently live in Germany, and I study theology. So as part of my studies, I am doing an internship at IEC. Um, so I arrived a week ago. We'll stay here for another week. Um, yeah. And what led you to study theology? Why are you doing that? I will actually get back to that more later on, but okay. basically the main idea is that I want to become a Christian trauma therapist. So I studied uh, psychology, and I thought on top a solid foundation in theology is useful um, to serve people in trauma therapy. Um, okay. Yeah. And you're going to say more about that, so I'm, I'm not stealing the thunder, but trauma therapy, so helping people who have gone through severe hardships and trauma, and you're preparing to get ready for that in a way. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Great. Hey, Tina, thank you so much for being with us, and we're looking forward to what the Lord has put on your heart. Thank you. Yeah, so as I already said, I want to become a Christian trauma therapist. There is this... Um, organization that works against abol or that works to abolish uh, human slavery, especially sex trafficking. Uh, it's called A21, and when I was 15 years old, I watched this documentary about this uh, organization, and I was very moved by it, and I thought I really want to dedicate my life in helping those people, and so I did some research on what kind of fields of professions they're working with, um, and it became pretty obvious pretty soon that psychology is the way to go for me. Um, so, I have been studying psychology, I finished my master's already, but there is the more that needs to be in, or, in order to become a Christian or a, a trauma therapist. Um, so I need a bachelor's and a master's in psychology, and then I also need a, a post-grad training in psychotherapy, and then an advanced vocational training in traumatology. So it's, it's a whole lot, it's a long way to go, on top of it, it totally we're talking about 11 to 12 years here. Um, so that's a huge chunk of time, um, and because of that, I was very early on dedicated to really finish my studies on time, to really be quick, to really get it done, um, and I did that. I finished my bachelor's and master's in less than four years, which was a bit too much, um, and I was very, very tired at the end of it. So I thought, well, in order to use my time wisely, why not? Uh, also study theology, have like a gap year at a Bible school, um, get a solid foundation in theology, but also get some rest. 
So that's what I did. I went to Bible school, um, and also I did apply for my post-grad training. Um, and it was amazing because I got my dream position offered in the very south of Germany. There is this Christian mental health rehabilitation center, um, and it's the only one in the entire country where they really actively implement faith into se therapy. So if you want to become a Christian therapist, that's the place to go. That's the place where you can learn. Um, and I got a position offered, and I was super excited about it. It's an area where I don't know anybody, um, but one of my friends, she was moving from that place, and she moved out of her apartment where she was living with two other Christian girls. And she said, actually, you know what? You could probably could just have the room. I could, like, suggest it to the girls in the house. And I went there, and I saw the place, and it was beautiful. It was walking distance from the city center. They had a little garden. They were, were growing their own vegetables. So I really thought, oh, my goodness, God is providing. God is good. He is faithful. He's doing everything that I could dream of. But then um, I started having, after accepting the position, I started having these intense moments of anxiety, um, and I got a lot of physical complaints. I have neurodermatitis, and it got really bad. I had, my entire body was full of rashes. Um, I started sleeping really bad, often only four to five hours max a night for weeks. And one morning I woke up and I could only see black dots because I was having my first migraine attack. Um, that is when I knew something was very much wrong. So I went to the GP, got a full body check up. Well, it turns out everything was fine with me physically. So the GP told me that she thinks it's psychosomatic and I should go see a psychologist. Well, the irony in that, I'm a psychologist, I'm a psychologist myself. Uh, one should think that I know how to take care of my mental well-being. Well, apparently I wasn't, um, because when I went to the psychologist, it turned out that I was in the middle of a deep exhaustion, close to a burnout from my studies in the Netherlands. And the psychologist told me that if I would now start my post-grad training, she could promise me my anxieties would get worse, my sleeping problems would get worse, and my physical complaints. Um, and she said that she's very confident that if I would do my training, I would not finish my four to five years of the training without a proper burnout. So there I was, thinking that God provided for me. This one. was think, thinking that God really provided for me. And it turns out that it was all a bit trickier. Um, so I was in this internal battle of what should I do right now. Usually those positions are assigned a year in advance, and it was only three and a half months until I should start my training. So I thought, there is no way I can let the clinic down. There is no way I can give up my dream position. If I cancel now, they will never give it to me again. Um, I didn't want to let go of the chains of living with Christian girls in a new city. I didn't want to let go of my timeline and my plans. But also I realized that my body didn't really allow me otherwise. And so while I was having this internal battle, I experienced so much anxiety thinking God provided now. If I turn this down, he won't provide again. And I realized that I don't really trust God. To me, trust was always this peaceful feeling and confidence that he will make sure everything will turn out just well in the end. And I didn't feel that way. And I was thinking maybe I don't trust God because my conception of trust is a bit off. So last summer, when this all happened, a journey for me started to figure out what is, what is trust? What does trusting in God mean? And I've learned from a wise man in the Old Testament um, who lives his trust as an act of worship to God. And uh, today we want to look a little bit closer into what that actually can look like. I'm reading from Genesis 22, verses 1 through 14. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. 
He said to the servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on, Isaac, on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached, his, reached out his hand and took the knife to slay him. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. This is actually the very first time the word worship is used in the Old Testament. So one can assume that this is teaching us something about worship. But when I read this, killing your only son doesn't to me really seem like an act of worship. So I was thinking, well, if my definition of trust is kind of off, maybe also my definition of worship is off. So I googled it and looked into some commentaries. And the actual definition of worship is the recognition of the entirely different nature of God. Worship is the, entire, the recognition of the entirely different nature of God. So that's already the first point from the passage. God is different than we think. We read in the first two verses that God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. They actually had a very close relationship, Abraham and God. Um, in Genesis 12, verses 2 to 3, we read, The Lord said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham got to know God as somebody who's overwhelmingly kind, who's generous, who's good, who is able, because back then, when Abraham was given that promise, he and his wife Sarah, they didn't have any children. Um, and 25 years later, they received Isaac as a promise of God. Abraham got to know God as somebody who's really for him. And now God doesn't show himself as this loving friend. He shows himself as somebody who's demanding, who's cruel, who's terrifying. And of course, we know that he isn't like that because in the verse 1 it says, um, Ab God tested Abraham, but Abraham doesn't know that. So he is experiencing God in this way. And God doesn't explain, he doesn't justify, he doesn't apologize for his command. He simply commands an absolute absurdity. An absurdity in many ways, because first, next slide please, God's request doesn't align with Abraham's values. He loves his son. Like, why would you kill your child that you love? That makes no sense. Second, God's request doesn't align with Abraham's plans. They waited for Isaac for 25 years. It's the most precious thing in their marriage. And they had a promise to it. Third, God's request also doesn't align with what he thought God's will is. God's covenant with Abraham depended on Isaac. So in a lot of different ways, this led to a huge crisis. And of course, the crisis that I experienced last summer was in no way comparable to this one. And yet, I had this feeling that God gave me something that I so strongly desired, and as soon as I had it, he took it all back. He requested it all back um, without any explanation, and that was really hard. And so I, like, I would like for us all to take a minute to think about whether you have ever experienced that ask, God asked you for something really special, or have you ever experienced God in a way that you absolutely couldn't understand, and how have you reacted to that? Well, let's have a look at Abraham's reaction. 
It says in verse 3, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had caught enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Abraham reacts with trust. So the second point is trust as an act of worship. Abraham here, he doesn't argue with God. He simply does as told. And when I read this first, I thought, oh, Abraham must be a very cold-hearted man. Like somebody tells him, kill your son, and he's like, all right, I'm going to do it. But actually, he's not. Um, Even though we don't have any explicit account of his internal state um, in this passage, the weird order of of events kind of gives it away. He first got up, he then loaded his donkey, then he took with him the servants, then he cut the wood, and then he set out for the place. That's weird because usually somebody would get up, wake the servants, or they would already be awake and already like start doing the work. Then you would let the servants load the donkey, and then you set out for the place, and then you cut the wood there. I'm assuming this weird order of events is happening because Abraham probably did not sleep well. Probably he was frightened, probably he was in shock, and I, probably he could not think straight. That's why he got up in the morning, he loaded a donkey that then had to wait for a long time with all the luggage, then he took his servants, then he remembered, oh, wood needs to be cut, so he's cutting the wood, which is also really odd because Abraham is living in Beersheba. And the land of Moriah, well, there's a whole discussion on where that exactly is, but most scholars believe it's the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which is 70 kilometers away from Beersheba, and it's a place where there is wood. So Abraham cut all the wood to then have it carried on a donkey for 70 kilometers. And the only sensible explanation that there is, to me at least, is that he wanted to delay departure, he didn't want to go. So that all kind of shows that he was emotionally very involved. And when we think back of the definition of worship, namely that it's the recognition of the entirely different nature of God, then that is exactly what we see in Abraham's reaction here. He accepts that God is entirely different than he has shown him so far. When I was applying for my postgrad training, I was obviously nervous and like really hoping for, for a good spot and a good place. And a lot of my friends, my Christian friends, said to me, oh, just trust that God will give you the right position. And I noticed that so often in my own life that I trust that God will do a specific thing for me. Maybe for you it's not a job. Maybe for you it's trusting that he will make your path cross with that one very special person that will be your husband or your wife. Or maybe it is that he will bless you with those children that you've been praying for for a long time. And I think that God wants to bless us, but those are actually all things that God never promised us. So can we trust in those? Abraham's trust is very different. He doesn't trust in a specific solution, but he trusts in God's character and his nature. He got to know him as somebody who's good, who's trustworthy, who's able, and he trusts in his character even when it makes no sense to him, even when the circumstances tell him very differently right now. And that's not easy. His Leaving for Moriah was an act of worship, but it was an anxious worship. It was one that felt pretty horrible. And it gets even worse because we would assume that if God puts us in such a position that is so terrible, at least he would comfort us in the middle of the crisis. At least he would give a sense of peace and show us that he's there. But we read in verse 4, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. On the third day. There is no encounter in between. There is no conversation in between. God keeps silent. He doesn't even seem to care to comfort. Then it goes on. And in verse 5, he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Even though it's so heartbreaking, Abraham holds on to what he knows. He says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. This is kind of a vague answer. Maybe 
he just didn't want to tell Isaac the truth of what he was about to do because it's just terrible for a son to know that. But still, Abraham holds on to what he knows about his God. God is somebody who will provide, and even if that looks like the worst case scenario at the moment. And then they, they go on, they move on, and they reach the place God had told him about. So probably, I'm just thinking, probably Abraham was like walking up the mountain thinking, God, you've been silent for three days now. If you still want to change the situation, if you still want to step in and give a different solution, now would really be the time. This is like your last time to do something. And then they reach the mountain top, and still there is nothing. And I know from myself that so often when God doesn't act according to my idea of good, I get scared. And Abraham was scared too, and yet he was so willing to let go of his relationship to Isaac, definitely, but also to Sarah, because which wife would stay with you after you just murdered her son? He was willing to let go of the image people have of him. Sarah believed he would bring back her son. The servants really believed that they would just go to worship and then come back together. He was willing to let go of his dream of a future because God's promise depended on Isaac. And he was willing to let go of his image of God, the God that he knew was somebody who's so good, so generous, so kind, who's for him, who made a promise, and now seems to take it all back. He was willing to let go of everything and to be obedient to a God who commands something that makes no sense at all, who's silent when he should speak, who very clearly doesn't have a good plan, and who decides to take everything away. Not to get something in return, not to receive a blessing as a reward, not to impress people or earn favor, no, simply to worship God, to recognize the entirely different nature of God. And he didn't define what it had to look like for God to be good and to be able. And so again, I want to bring us into a, a minute of reflection, thinking about whether you ever or whether you trust that God is good and able, even when he doesn't step in the way you expect, even when it actually costs you everything, even when he won't heal your sickness, even when he won't give you that husband or wife, even when he don't, won't like, fill in whatever it is for you. Fortunately, in verse 11, it says, But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abram, Abraham, here I am, he replied. On time, God stepped in. Abram already raised his hand to slay his son, but then God steps in. And sometimes we don't give him the chance because we're too impatient. We turn around and take things in our own hands as soon as we reach a mountaintop and realize God isn't pr pr uh, providing the sacrifice. But here, God really keeps his promises to make a huge generation out of Isaac. He is proving to be good and faithful. He is still God Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one who said, I am love and I am faithful and I am good to you. And he doesn't change, never. But also he is I am who I am. That's the name he gave himself. What kind of name is that I am who I am? It doesn't tell us anything about him. Well, probably that's exactly the point that he's so incomprehensible, so indescribable, so much higher and wider that we can't understand. And even when we can't see it in our circumstances, he is still worthy of our praise and of our trust and of our worship. So the third point is praise as an act of worship. In verse 14, we read, So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. It all ends in this worship, the Lord will provide. And I love how he repeats the verse that he said in verse 8. Um, the Lord will provide. He said it in an, in an anxiously way as a response to the question, Father, where is the sacrifice? He said it in a great distress. It was a discouraged reminder of who God says he is. And now he shouts out those same verses, the same word, words as praise. He trusted in God's character um, and not in a specific reaction of God. And now God really shows up. And I want to encourage us, let us be those people who in the mess, even in the middle of the crisis, still declare what God says about himself. 
let's declare God's truth so that later on they might turn into this joyous praise. This isn't just a story about a hero who was obedient and trusted God. This is a story of someone who is suffering because he experienced God in a very different way than expected. Somebody who's cruel, who puts him in the misery and lets him alone in that misery. Yet he chose to worship and he chose to trust silently, painfully, and lonely. And I think that most of us can sympathize. There have been situations where we felt left by God. But this story really shows that our emotions are not the end. God allows pain, yes, and he allows desperation. But the story isn't over with Abraham's painful walk to Moriah. It's not over when he gives Isaac the elements for the sacrifice to carry. It's not over when Abraham lifts his hand to slay his son. The story isn't an example of what our faith should look like or how obedient we should be. No, it's a story about the one who we can have faith in, even if we can't see his goodness just yet. This story shouldn't lead to praising Abraham. That's why the place isn't called Abraham Obeyed. No, it's a story that should lead to praising God because he still can turn the greatest hardships into stories of praise. That's why the place is called The Lord Will Provide. The name really sums up his experience and the takeaway from the story. And it's also what I have experienced. I went to the clinic, I turned down my position, and I was told, surprisingly, that they would still love to have me, and whenever I'm ready, I should just call, and we will see when the next positions open up. And it's so great because I've experienced that God does really provide, and he already provided the most important salvation and forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ, who was crucified for us. In Romans 8, 32, we read, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? The cruel, horrific thing God never intended to actually have Abraham do, he did himself for us. Jesus was all human, he was all God, he loved, lived this perfect life, which ended in his crucifixion, and what seemed to the disciples as a cruel act, complete opposite of their definition of good, something that does not align with their idea of God's plan in setting Jesus as the Messiah, yet was God's plan, yet God was good in it. He did the most unspeakable thing out of pure love for us because he wants to be, be in relationship with us, with me, with you. And if you want that as well, if you've never made the decision, you can make it now. All that it takes is a simple prayer saying, God, if that is really you, if you've gone all that far just for me, I want to accept that forgiveness and I want to be in relationship with you. Maybe you already know Jesus. And if you're currently in a situation where you feel like he asked too much of me, maybe you already kind of loaded your donkey, but you, you're too scared to go. Or maybe you chose to go and you chose to trust, but currently you're on this three-day journey and it's just too hard and he's silent and it's painful and it's really difficult to endure. Or maybe you just arrived at the mountaintop and God still isn't providing and this time it really seems like he's too late. Well, whatever situation you are in right now, I want to declare that he is good. He is the God who provides. He's able and he is trustworthy. The prayer team will be around soon, and I want to invite you all to make use of that. And let's lift up our prayers and our situations to God together. The great thing is that we don't have to trust in specific ways for him to answer our prayer, but we can trust in his character, the things that he proclaimed about himself. And so I want to read out a few to you as a reminder, and then we want to go into worship. Jesus says, I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no God. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. God is love. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. 
In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Would you like to stand? So what we're going to do now, we're continuing to, to sing and worship, but what we're also going to do is we're having an opportunity for anyone who wants to be prayed for. And if I can ask those who raise their hands from the team, I'll be Hannah, Carol, Tracy, if you can already walk uh, behind the altar. So if, if you now just would want someone to pray for you, with you, maybe just acknowledge that you're maybe on the journey, carrying the wood, maybe you're already at the mountaintop and you're still wondering where, where is God and all that. If, if that is you, Maybe if you're just uh, perplexed and confused, and why do you, as we're going to sing, just make your way, you can kneel down or you can stand with someone and they will pray for you. And we will then very quickly end the service, but we will continue praying here. So anyone who wants, not only during this song, but then also until the end, feel very free to come, make your way towards the front. But let's worship as Abraham showed us how to do. Right, let's finish the Sunday service today with glorifying his name, his majesty. So let's sing King of Majesty. This is like old song, but I think everybody knows this song. Yeah. I re it reminds me of my college, uh, college time. But let's clap our hand and sing to praise his name.
said to Abraham, now I know that you fear me because you would not have spared your son. And we can say to God as we head into this week, now we know that you love us because you did not spare your son. You go into this week loved, so go in peace and serve the Lord with joy as his beloved. Um, don't run away before you have grabbed a cup of coffee and let's talk. And then next week we have again communion. We continue our series on relationships. So welcome to join us next week. But Let's connect with a cup of coffee, tea, or anything you'll find. God bless you.